okay? Well, I go to church. Well, I live on a farm. Well, do you farm it? No, I weld. Well, then you're not a farmer. You're a welder. Well, I go to church. Yeah, but do you act like a Christian? No, uh, you know, no, I don't. I act like the devil. Then, then we're not, okay, all right, just, just kind of helping us a little bit. You see, I don't think, when you look at this here parable, he's talking about a farmer. You know, I don't think God, he called him a fool. He said, you're a fool. That's pretty strong language. You're a fool, meaning you're operating foolishly. Well, I have to think about this. Why did God call him a fool? Because when you read some of this, some of this doesn't seem to be very foolish. Because did he call him a fool because he was a farmer? No, there's nothing wrong with him being a farmer. Uh, that's not why he called him a fool. Uh, well, I don't think God called him a fool because he was a rich man. God does not hate rich people. Did you know that? Okay, you can be wealthy, you can be wealthy and be saved on fire for God and God love you just like the pauper uh, on a back alley somewhere. Okay, it's not the riches that determine your standing with God or whether he loves you or not. The only thing Jesus ever said and the only thing Paul ever said was that if you do have riches, don't set your heart on them. That's all, okay? So this is not because he was a rich man. He said, well, you're a fool because you have money. No, that's, that's not it. Here's number three. It, obviously, this guy was a very hard worker. He was a hard worker. And I can tell you right now, throughout the Bible, God is not against hard work. I'll tell you what he is against, <laughs> lazy people. Oh, he can't stand lazy people. God has a welfare system for lazy people. You know what it is? Starvation. Now, you said amen before you thought about that. Okay, he does. Lazy people. Our, well, I shouldn't say it. They're going to write letters probably. But, but God has a welfare system for the United States of America. He does. If you're able body and you don't go to work, I'm not talking about being laid off sick or anything else. I'm not, you know, within reason. But if you know if a guy is just a lazy bum and lays on his couch and he should be out there working, God says, oh, I've got a remedy for that. <laughs> uh, uh, let him run out of food. Yeah, but he'll be over begging and we feel bad. No, don't give him anything. He gets down to a certain point. He'll start saying, I think I better get to work and get some food in my mouth. All right? Nobody likes that laziness. Laziness. God doesn't either. You know why? God's a hard worker. Huh? God is. He's a worker. Uh, uh, when we get to heaven, we, you know, we won't be sitting around sipping iced tea, sitting down, looking like we're in the Bahama sun with our feet crossed and just saying, my, I tell you, for years on end. So, boy, I tell you, how long you been here? Oh, I've been sitting here for 10 years. No, there won't be. God will come by and boot you off the chair. Say, look, we got work to do. Let's get with it. Amen. We are not saved to go have a vacation. <laughs> believe me, believe me, it's going to be wonderful in heaven, but you're going to work, so am I. What are we going to do? We're going to eventually rule and reign with Christ, which is a lot of work. Okay? All right. Just <laughs> you get that idea. People say, oh, I'll get to heaven, you know, we'll sip iced tea and just oh, float around in the clouds, become a bunch of lazy bums and be God's personal welfare system. No, we're not. We're going to be trained because when we come back on the horse with Christ, we're going to be put to work right away. Okay? Now, you may not be shoveling dirt, but you're going to be ruling over those who are shoveling dirt. Some of you have been what? Hey, some of them's been wanting to wear a white hard hat for a long time, okay? I've been wanting to do it, and so we're going to get to do it after a while, all right? We're all going to be like Kirk here after a while. We're going to have white hard hats, okay? And so we're going to be ruling and reigning with him. Now, what's number four? He, he, here's another thing. Was he called a fool because he took care of what he had? You know, it says, when you read that, he took care of his substance. He didn't, he didn't waste it in that per se, uh, or, or per se. He took care of what he had. And so when God looks at it and says, well, you're a fool because you took care of what you had. No, that's not it either. It was not because he took care of what he had. It was not because he was a hard worker. It was not because he was a rich man. It was not because simply he had a vocation that he was a farmer. God didn't call him a fool for that. But there's other reasons why he was called a fool. And you'll find it in verse 17. Look at verse 17, if you would. He says, and he thought within himself saying, what shall I do because I have no more room where to bestow my fruits? He kicks off in verse 17 is he was self-centered. 
He thought only about himself. He didn't mention anybody else. He did not mention God. He didn't mention uh, 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 children. He didn't mention his neighbor. He didn't mention his own uh, community. Nothing. The only thing he talks about in this entire parable, in this farmer, all he speaks about is I, 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 and my, my, my. I tell you what, you could almost lump the American public right into this guy right here. It's all about I, I, me, me, me. And that's why we always want other people to do things for us all the time. You can say, man, I, I know we're getting a little slightly political there, but, you know, we, we live in this entitlement mind. You know, it's all about me. Well, well, somebody owes, you know, nobody owes us anything. Nobody owes us anything. You know, Jesus didn't even owe us anything. That's why it's called grace, thank God. <laughs> Amen. You see, the letter I is mentioned in this parable. He says I six times. And he says me five times, or my. <laughs> you see, 11 times he mentions a personal pronoun or something about himself. You see, he cared for nobody else but himself. Jesus Christ is totally against selfishness because selfishness is at the other end of the spectrum from humility, which only glorifies God and exemplifies itself in total dependency on him, saying, I am nothing without Jesus Christ. Amen? Self-centeredness. What is another one? I got something for you. He was not even, when you read this, when we read this, he was not grateful to God. Not one time does he recognize God for his blessings. Not one time does he say, you know what? I thank God for these provisions. I thank God for these blessings. I thank God that he made these finances available. I thank God that my barns are filled. I thank God I had seed to sow and harvest to, to reap. I thank God that I, I have these workers to help me. I, I thank God that I had health to go out there and work in the field. How many times do we routinely go through life and we forget to stop and say, thank you, Jesus, for what you have provided for me. The other day, the Holy Spirit reminded me and I came out and began to pray and I just, I just began to thank God. Lord, thank you for health in my body. Thank you that I feel good today in my physical body. Thank you, God, for the air that you have given me to breathe. Sorry, Lord, I'm, I apologize for taking taken for granted all of these little so-called blessings that we get to enjoy in everyday life. Amen? You see, we stop and realize how grateful because look, if it wasn't for the air he breathed, I'd be dead. Huh? It, 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 we ought to thank God when we feel good. How about a brother Ken? We ought to thank God when we feel good because there are times you're not going to feel good. Amen? But we can pray and get beyond it. Here's another thing. He made preparation, verses 18 and 19. He said, this will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. He made preparation to take care of his goods, his, his products, uh, but none for his soul. I'm going to get to even more. It's going to bear down on us here in just a moment. He made preparation for things. He made sure. He took extra care. He went the extra mile. I mean, he went over and beyond in making sure what he had amassed, his things, his things that he owned, the things that he had produced, so to speak, all of this, he made sure he took care of all of these things that there was a future for. It was going to be used, etc. But he did not make any preparation for his soul. How many times does that happen? Where we will make preparation for our things of life, our monies of life, our our retirements of life, everything else, which is fine. But then we do it at the neglect that our own soul goes neglected and it suffers as a result. Amen? He did not do for his soul what he was doing for his, for his things. Here's another one. Listen to this. He prepared, according to these verses, he prepared for old age, but he didn't prepare for dying. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. He prepared for old age, but he didn't prepare to die. You know, we're like that. Uh, how many people, they prepare for the day they retire. They work their whole life simply so I can retire and have a life that is good. As, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. It's wisdom to do that. It's nothing wrong. They have investments or somebody is laid back for retirement or whatever the case and they made sure their mortgage has been paid and they don't have this extra strapling upon their lives and so forth. Nothing wrong with that. But isn't it amazing that this man, he prepared for his things 
chosen for the time that he would retire in his old age, but he did not prepare to die. It's interesting to me that people seem to love their body more than their soul. <laughs> Am I right? We, we tend to like the things more than our soul. And so we have to be careful of that. Listen to this. Parents will work for physical welfare of children, but not their spiritual welfare. Uh, and we have to be careful of that as well, getting imbalanced. How many times does parents, uh, and, and many have been guilty of this, of course, and, and, but they will prepare and prepare for the physical well-being of the child. They'll prepare and prepare, making sure they've got the clothes and being hit and getting in school and looking like the rest, you know, being up so they're not made fun of, this, that, and the other thing. They'll make sure that that child uh, gets into this program, that program. They'll make sure that they'll have this kind of tuition for their college or get them into grants and all of this and all of this. And then I have to wonder, though, but why don't we put as much care into their spiritual well-being? You know, there's very few parents that'll sit down at the kitchen table and say, son, daughter, you're going to sit down here and we're going to read the Bible tonight. We're we're going to sit down, turn the phone off, going to turn off the television, and we're going to break open the bread of life just like we just fed you a chicken and mashed potatoes. Somebody shout amen for chicken. <laughs> and, 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 but now we're going to feed you something better than chicken and mashed potatoes, and we're going to learn the word. And then how many takes that child and goes into a side room and says, now we're going to kneel down and we're going to pray together. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to show you how to pray. I'm going to pray for you. And then I'm going to have you pray as well. When was the last time and how how many parents ever do that with their young children? Think about what I'm saying. And then we're the first ones to complain because little Johnny and Susie don't want to go to church. They don't want to pray. They don't want to serve God. You know why? It's just like Lot's wife. They're in the pastor's desk this morning. You know, we blame her. She could have been a pillar of faith, but she became a pillar of salt. Why? Uh, she made the choice because her heart was still longing for what was in Sodom. Her body left, but her heart was still there. But you know, we always blame her. Oh, she's this, she's that. I want to tell you something. She was trained because they were married at a young age. They always did at that time. And she was trained by her husband who was the head of the house and she saw his example of letting go of the things of God to chase after making himself feel good and after riches in Sodom at the expense of their own soul. And she saw a man of that house make bad decisions. And he based them on feelings. He based them on emotions. And he based them on a get rich screen scheme and left Abraham to make all of this money. But honey, what is it in life if you make a million dollars in a year if you lose your soul? What is the good out of that? What is the good if I never teach my child how to pray, how to read the Bible, how to understand the things of Christianity, and then take it a step further and live it before them? and live that life, and honey, they can grow up and be a doctor of doctors. But if I didn't leave them the golden precious word and seed in their life, I have failed in that life. Can I hear an amen? I mean, it's not easy. It's not easy in this world or any time period that we live in because there's a lot of things that vie for people's lives. There's a lot of trinkets out there that's glistening, but not everything that glitters is gold. <laughs> Amen? I mean, there's a lot of things out there that tries to pull them in every direction. That's why we have to keep them grounded in the things of the Lord. And you see, I want to tell you something. Uh, many times, well, children take it, well, it's a fairy tale. They want to be like their friends and so forth. I want to tell you what the greatest impact in a child's life is, is when mom and dad live uh, what they profess and live uh, what they sing in church. It backs it up. Well, I, I'm going to speak to the ministers here in, in, in another month or so, and the God has laid it on my heart. One of the things, <laughs> one of the, <laughs> this is interesting. I had a very, believe it or not, a very famous preacher. I, I tweeted him one day, and I, very famous. I didn't think he'd even reply. I just tweeted him one day, and I said, uh, Dr. So-and-so, I said, uh, listen, I said, going to Nigeria, and I said, been over there many times, but I said, you know, I want to draw on somebody else. And I made it very short, but I said to him, I said, when I go there, what would be your number one piece of advice? I couldn't believe it. He actually tweeted me back. And he said, Reuben, he said, preach your greatest persuasions. 
I'll never forget that. Preach your greatest persuasion. That may not mean much to you, but it did to me. I'll tell you why. Because a man will not preach his, if he doesn't preach his greatest persuasions, he will not preach it with an oomph. In other words, if I preach simply what I heard somebody else say, but if it's not a part of my life, I'll not have the conviction to thrust it out that I believe what I'm preaching. See, it's the same way in life. If I just say I'm a Christian, but I'm not living it, then that conviction's not there, and there's no oomph to that lifestyle and that living. Amen? And so we, we have to come into grips with this. You see, he prepared for old age, but he didn't prepare to die. The greatest thing we have to understand, as, as much as we need to prepare for old age, we need more to prepare to die because we may not make it to old age. It's sad to say, and I don't mean to go down that trek, but it's very painful to go down that road. I've buried more than my fair share of 20-year-old kids. Way too, I can name several right off the bat, several I have put in the ground uh, in, in, in funerals, in settings. And the saddest thing in the world is to do it. And, and not only them was something self-inflicted, uh, some of them was just driving down the road and didn't do anything and simply got broadsided or whatever and killed instantly. I'm thinking of one young lady. He, she actually was, uh, uh, matter of fact, her stepdad was my best friend. And, uh, but years had separated us after I got saved, just, just years had separated us, hadn't heard from them. And I'll never forget, you talk about a phone call changing a life. I mean, it was just interesting. Uh, but I'll never forget that morning, I think I was here at the office actually that morning and, and she had grown up with my, my sons and, and so I knew them real, real well. But it's just that over years, we had separated probably for 14 or 12, 13 years, 14 years. And I'll never get sitting in that office, the phone call come in. And that particular morning, a uh, young lady just going out Route 30 and just minding her own business. She was going to a job interview and uh, her life was getting changed around. She'd been down a tough road, but everything was looking up. She had now back on track. Things was going good for her and she was going to a, a place out on 30 to have a job interview. Somebody had pulled out in front of her and she swerved to miss them. And when she did, she went broadsided in oncoming traffic and SUV hit it instantaneously. She was taken from this world, 20 years old. Never forget, sitting in that office, a phone call come to me, another mutual friend of the family. The family didn't call me, but the, the mutual friend called and he said, Reuben, he said, uh, something bad has really happened. He said, please, uh, he said, could you call uh, so-and-so? And, -so? and uh, I thought, oh, I, you know, and, and right away, I, I don't know what happened. I, I just out of the blue and I called and sure enough, uh, when I called, the girl was dead. And they, the, the mother, uh, I'll never forget this, when that officer showed up that door, when he said to her, listen to this, in less than 60 seconds, life can change just that quick. That officer stood at that door and said, I'm sorry to tell you, but your daughter, named her name, has died. She actually, she convulsed and, and literally began to throw up almost uncontrollably because in that instant, her precious jewel, it was gone. It was gone forever. And you, you see, folks, when I, when I made that call, they said, would you please come to the hospital right away? And I went to that hospital and, and went into that morgue and, and, and saw the lifeless body of that child, 20 years old. There it is. Life is over. I want to tell you something. I, uh, what hit me at that very moment was this. Uh, it doesn't matter what age, we've got to be ready to meet Jesus Christ. I, I, you say, well, I'm not a reckless person. And I'm like, no, but you live well around a lot of reckless people. <laughs> you live around a lot of others that can cause harm to your life. You've got to be ready. And so we're all susceptible to that. Here's another thing in verse 21. In verse 21, he says, so he, is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, Jesus continuously emphasized, please lay up treasure in heaven. Paul even said the same thing. You see, he laid up treasures in the wrong place. Again, God is not against accumulating some sort of wealth on this earth, but he would prefer it's used for his glory and the furtherance of the kingdom and not just merely a hoarding up of finances. Amen. Uh, one of the things that stifle the progression of the kingdom of God on the earth is the hoarding financially that's diverted into other things in life, but not given and for the projection of the gospel. I mean, you'd be amazed. I mean, people will sling money at Walmart. <laughs> well, but could you help the gospel get out? Well, I don't, I can't hardly do that. Huh? Come on now. 
Come on, I'm being serious. I mean, I mean, you, 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 take, you can take the gospel around the world, but it takes money to do it. <laughs> well, just go by faith. All right, let's, pr let's practice that principle. When the bill collector comes, tell him you're paying it by faith. Uh-huh. Just operate the same principle. What's it take? That bill collector says, well, I'm real impressed, but I want to see the money. <laughs> okay? It is the same thing with the gospel going around the world. Is it takes money to do that. And so, it, it, <laughs> you see, he laid up treasures in the wrong place. But, you know, how, you say, well, how do you lay up treasures in heaven? I want to tell you something. Every soul that you win to Christ, you're laying treasure up in heaven. Do you know every act of obedience, you are incurring treasure in heaven? Did you know that? Every time you obey God, you're putting treasure in heaven. Do you know every time you give to the kingdom of God, you'll be blessed here, but you're also raising your account in heaven as well. Rewards are coming your way in heaven. All you have to be is just be patient. You can be poor as Job's turkey now, but when you get to heaven, you ain't going to be poor no more. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There's more to life than the almighty dollar. There's more to life than what we have to spend. What we have is Jesus Christ, and that is the most important thing. We've got to keep.